Now, both Moderna and BioNTech are developing COVID-19 vaccines using an RNA platform. For anyone watching who doesn't know what that is, can you explain briefly how that kind of vaccine works and how it maybe differs from more traditional approaches? Well, Ugar was first in, I think, envisioning this, so I'll let him go first. <laughs> Thanks, Cal. Yeah. So messenger RNA vaccine um, is, is a vaccine which is based on delivering of genetic information. Uh, so the messenger RNA is a, is a, is a natural molecule uh, which, which can be used to encode the, the piece of information uh, to induce an immune response against the virus. We take a part of the virus, which, which is important to, 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 uh, to induce a strong, effective immune response, uh, uh, encrypt that with messenger RNA and deliver the messenger RNA in a way that it can be taken up by human cells and uh, human cells uh, produce the vaccine. So it is, it is a very clean way of delivering of information. And the messenger RNA thereafter is degraded, so there is no, uh, nothing left thereafter. It's a, it's a uh, uh, extremely precise, precise uh, way of inducing, inducing immune response. Tell, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, no, I, just to build on that, that's exactly right. The, the, the beauty here is we actually don't use the virus. In fact, we've never had the virus in our labs. We don't need it. It starts with the genetic information. And so we precisely show the immune system just that bit we want the immune system to recognize, uh, which in this case, it's the spike protein. It's what the virus needs in order to enter cells. And that allows this kind of methodology to both move very quickly into the clinic but also be very effective biologically. Yeah, so tell us a bit more about um, the advantages of this approach. Obviously, we haven't previously licensed an mRNA vaccine, so it's pretty new technology. Um, why, why, why could it be better? Well, I'll take a first step here. We haven't licensed yet, <laughs> is the way I, I, I characterized it. Uh, I think we both believe we're on the path to uh, the first approvals for this technology. It is better in a number of... Uh, fundamental ways, let me just touch on three. The first is because we start with genetic information, there is a component of speed that allows you to get into the clinic and then once you're in the clinic, scale up manufacturing. It's not by chance that you know the two leading, I think, efforts both leverage mRNA uh, technologies. I think the second one, which Uger touched on, is the biological preciseness. So when you make a recombinant protein or you otherwise characterize a biologic, uh, the process makes a lot of difference and a lot of things can go wrong. When you're transmitting the information, there's no way for the cell to make the wrong bit. And so you, the, the biological fidelity, if you will, uh, has a higher likelihood to then translate into the kind of immune response you want. And I think the last element here is it's a very flexible platform, and this takes us a little bit beyond COVID, but the infrastructure required is, is relatively small and relatively quick, which means in the manufacturing space, you have a tremendous agility that usual technologies don't. So if, if you have to dedicate an entire plant to make a recombinant vaccine, you can understand why it would take a company quite some time and a lot of capital to come to the conclusion that they want to do that. I think our footprint is much smaller, so it's much easier to move with agility. Uh, and I think that will translate into benefit in the future when we think about a world where more and more vaccines are based on this technology. Excellent. And give us a bit of a, an overview of where both of your companies are at with the COVID vaccine. When can we hopefully expect to hear good news and what, what stage have you got to by now? Maybe maybe I I take that question and so so we started we started to uh, to um, develop vaccines relatively early uh, when the pandemic was was of course not visible to to the rest of the world so we started end of January with the vaccine development we have uh, we have gone to phase one clinical testing which is essentially evaluating whether the vaccine is safe and induces immune responses. And now, now, now we are in, in phase three testing. And the phase three testing is an extremely important step in drug development. It gives you the information whether the vaccine 
is not only safe with re regard to the frequent side effects, but whether they are potential rare side effects. So we are evaluating currently uh, the safety of our vaccine in more than 44,000 uh, participants. This is done in a, in, a, in a randomized fashion using a control uh, and in a blinded fashion. So, so we, uh, we, we don't see who is getting the vaccine and who is getting the control. And in this analysis in a blinded fashion, uh, allows allows the investigator to really come come up with a with a with an unbiased evaluation of the safety and the second aspect to be investigated of course is the efficacy the key question is uh, is uh, whether the uh, uh, people who were vaccinated who received the vaccine uh, has a lower lower likelihood or lower number of infection as compared to the control group and if this is the case, then we would, uh, uh, we would be able to demonstrate efficacy. So that means the prophylactic activity, the preventive activity of the vaccine and the combination of both would allow us to say we have here an effective and safe vaccine. Tal, what yeah, about Moderna? I think, uh, yeah, we're, we're, I, I think we're, we're neck and neck. We're in a similar place. Uh, we are, our, our phase three trial is being run in collaboration with the U.S. government, with the National Institutes of Health. Um, we're expect to complete, I think, enrollment in the coming weeks of a 30,000 subject trial. Half are getting the placebo and half are getting the vaccine. And as Uger mentioned, the only way to know that a vaccine actually prevents disease is to show that people who got the vaccine didn't get the disease versus those who didn't get the vaccine and by chance some will get the disease. And so when people ask, well, you know, what's the timeline? Why is it so fast? Why isn't it quicker? It really is dependent on the rate of cases that are going to occur in the trial participants. So once everybody's been vaccinated, we sort of watch them and, and, and we follow them closely and we start to count cases. And when we see that number of cases uh, arise, we then unblind and, and uh, actually it's the Data Safety Monitoring Committee that unblinds and looks to see whether we actually have proof of efficacy. I think uh, we expect that to come given that we're both enrolling our trials in areas where uh, unfortunately there's high transmission. Uh, we expect to see results, I think, in the coming weeks and months. And this is the paradox of this vaccine development. The worse it is out there in terms of transmission, the quicker we will know whether the vaccine works. I mean, if you take the other extreme, if there was no pandemic and nobody would be getting infected, we would never know if a vaccine works. It's one of the reasons why to date we don't have a vaccine against SARS and MERS and all the other cousins of COVID. But we're in the midst of a pandemic. Unfortunately, it's true in Europe uh, with a second wave these days as well. And the more cases and the more transmission we have, uh, we all anticipate the sooner we'll be able to prove that these vaccines are indeed safe and effective. So we talk about the, the COVID vaccine race, um, and it is a race in the sense that we all desperately want a vaccine as soon as possible. But how important is it to be first, to be the first one to make an effective vaccine? Look, I'll, I'll, I, I, I've been pr pretty vocal about this, uh, although not everybody agrees with me. Uh, I only have two competitors here, the virus and the clock. Uh, I hope uh, Uger and BioNTech and Pfizer demonstrates the same efficacy and safety. The world needs much more than just one company to succeed here. I expect, you know, there's going to be a couple of phases for this. The first is fighting the pandemic while it's raging around us, during which uh, you need a minimally efficacious vaccine and you need whatever vaccine works to be deployed out there. I think in the long run, we will start to understand are there subtle differences or more than subtle differences between different vaccines and how does that influence their uptake? But I think that's for the day after the pandemic, if you will, is the way I'm thinking about it. Uber? Yeah, I, I, I think this is, this is uh, we are, uh, the, the way how, how the whole industry developed vaccines uh, against COVID-19 uh, shows shows really the best way is the best performance of collaboration. It's really important to see how how people teamed up for collaboration. Moderna teamed up with the uh, NIH. We teamed up with Pfizer. AstraZeneca teamed up with with the Oxford University. So there are an, a number of of models of collaborations models, and and we have the the the. Uh, strongest transparency in the development of a vaccine. People people see the data 
almost in real time coming in and people understand understand how phase one trial works how phase b trial works and even moderna and and we shared our protocols, our phase three protocols, so that everyone can see uh, in a transparent fa fashion how the studies are performed and how they are evaluated. I think it's, it's the, really the best way how pharmaceutical development should be in a way always addressing the medical need and, and, uh, and uh, trying to be as supportive and as transparent as possible. And as you say, things think, are moving. Think... Sorry, Tal. Yeah, just... Just to add on that, because I, I think Ugar makes a really important point. You know, the, the previous speaker uh, spoke towards the end about transparency and trust and, and science leading the way. And I think uh, these times have really brought the best in all of us in that regard. When we started to talk about our protocol, we were very clear. Here's our case definition. Here's the stats. Here's how many cases we will follow. And then I saw some discussion between a couple of key opinion leaders saying, well, you know, we're not sure we haven't seen their protocol. And I said, OK, I thought I told you everything you need to know. But if not, fine, let's let's publish our protocol. And, and we did that last Thursday. And, you know, everybody else quickly followed suit. And I think that sets the stage for what I actually hope will stay with us after COVID, that sense of commitment to transparency and to collaboration and to sharing in the manner that it's been happening. Great. So we're seeing things move on at a, a very fast pace. I mean, developing a vaccine, a new vaccine in one year, even two years is unheard of. Um, what makes you confident that we can do it? And do you have any concern that, you know, things could be rushing perhaps? Yeah, so, so one important aspect is that we, that we, that we instead of, of skipping things or cutting corners, we decided to do things in parallel. Usually vaccine development works that, that you do a phase one study and maybe maybe six or 12 months later a phase two study and then decide whether you would do a phase three study. This is based on, on, on minimizing the cost risk, but also based on the traditional way how, how drugs develop. It, 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 is, it is not the best way, it is just the traditional way. And, and in, in this situation, in this situation, we don't have time to wait. Yeah? But we also don't want to skip anything or cut corners. Therefore, we did many things in parallel. So we, uh, we, we together with our partner Pfizer, decided to, to provide the full budget for the project from the very beginning, yeah? including, including planning for phase three budget including investing into manufacturing from the very beginning before knowing even that our vaccine works. Yeah. So this is development at risk, but not at risk for, for, for the, for the people, but at risk for the company. Yeah. Uh, getting, uh, uh, going into cost risk. And, and it shows us that if we do this in this way, it is, it is, it is allow, it allows us to, to reduce all the time, uh, which is unproductive waiting for decisions, for example. So we have to, we, ha we had the situation that data came in on, on the same day we evaluated the data and made decisions based on the data. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and what is also important to, to mention is um, that the authorities, the regulators uh, closely collaborated with us. I have never seen that I that we sent a document uh, for for uh, to the to the local authority and get the result the feedback from the local authority just two days later yeah so this is this is of course a fantastic collaboration not only with the companies but also also with the with the authorities and it just shows as as Tal said this this really showed. Uh, the best way how 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 performance in drug drug development can be improved by close collaboration, but also by reducing reducing any unproductive unproduct uh, development times. The only point I'd add is actually to balance the speed. If you look carefully at what we've done, we've taken a very conservative approach to defining safety and efficacy here. These trials we're talking about have tens of thousands of patients, of, of participants, right? 30,000 in our case, 44,000 in the case of, of Uger's vaccine. 
Um, they're done to very rigorous standards, the, the definition of the endpoints. There are independent data safety monitoring committees. So it's not the company that's looking at the safety. It's not the company that's looking at the efficacy. These are independent, unbiased, conflict-free experts that continuously monitor that. And in our case, we've even gone a step further, and I can tell you this is that monitoring committee was actually appointed by the U.S. National Institutes of Health, not by Moderna. And so in terms of ensuring the veracity of the results and the safety of participants, we've been very conservative. If you look at the way the protocols have been designed for the endpoints and the confidence interval to be able to speak at the end when we have efficacy that we're sure about it, they're very conservative. The FDA has been more conservative than it has been, in fact, in, in some other vaccine cases. And so I think we the speed is to a large degree enabled by the platform, the collaborations, and ultimately the rate of transmission, which is what's going to drive cases on the trials. And that's been balanced by a very conservative view on the safety and the endpoints on these phase three trials. And when it comes to a COVID vaccine, I mean, what what is success? Obviously, it has to be safe. That goes without saying. Um, and it needs to be effective to a level. But it's not always the case with a vaccine that, you know, it's effective 100 percent. It's not necessarily a silver bullet. What what are you looking for in efficacy? Where what would be good <laughs> success? Can I start you? Well, you know, <laughs> there's no 100 percent in life except except my wife. Um, she's 100 <laughs> percent. Everything else, you know, is shades. Right. So. Uh, the reality is we expect to have a high level of efficacy because we've been able to reach a very high level of an immune response of neutralizing antibodies in the blood of participants. And every participant who've got, who's gotten our vaccine has these levels of neutralizing antibodies. So we are, we're actually hoping for, for quite high efficacy, certainly north of 60%, I would hope even higher. But you're right. Uh, it's not going to be 100%. Um, you know, if it's 80 or 90%, that's terrific. Even if it's 60%, that's good enough. And the reason is, if you get enough people immune, then you will stop transmission and you will ultimately stop disease. And so the goal here is to prevent disease at the individual level and ultimately at society level by achieving uh, enough people who are immune to this vaccine. And I think given the levels of immunogenicity we've seen so far, uh, we're certainly optimistic uh, that, that our platform and our vaccine should be able to achieve that. Uga? Yeah. Yeah, maybe I can add, add, add to that. Um, so the vaccine development uh, addresses three, three different goals. First of all, really addressing individual medical need. So we know uh, that there are that there are that there are individuals who are at highest risk uh, to uh, to have a to have a worse outcome from disease. These are elderly people. These are people with with uh, with um, severe lung dysfunction. These are immunocompromised uh, uh, patients, and 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 they are really waiting for this vaccine. And and we need a vaccine. Uh, uh, which is able to protect them and to prevent severe disease. And, 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 and this is really a huge medical need. The second is uh, that we would like to, to, to help that, that life in our society could become normal again. Yeah, so, so we are now in a, in a, in a situation, situation where everything is limited and, and there's a lot of frustration. The economy is suffering and, and people, people, uh, many, 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 many people are in a, in a crisis mode because, because, uh, because they are, their business is, is not working as, as, as they want it. So th this is the second goal. And for this, we need a vaccine which reduces transmission. Yeah. And then we have a third goal. And the third goal is uh, to make these vaccines and to, to, to ensure vaccine efficacy as high as possible to get rid of this, of this virus. Yeah. Uh, so, so really to ensure that, that we don't deal anymore with repeating epidemics uh, and that we can ensure uh, traveling without retesting. And, uh, and this will take time. This will take, uh, most likely this will take years until we are there. But these are the three goals that we have to address. 
You mentioned that, you know, the big effects that coronavirus has had, not just health-wise, but also economically and, um, you know, preventing people from living, lives, living life as normal. There's a lot of political mm. pressure on getting a vaccine. Obviously, it's, you know, there's a big <laughs> presidential election in the US this year as well. How do you deal with the politics? Yeah, I, I think there is there is of course a pressure pressure political pressure uh, in in every every country which is heavily affected by by that and it is very clear that we need a vaccine as as soon as possible, but we we clearly state we will not cut any corners. Our aim is to develop a vaccine according to the best standards uh, and and we recently. Um, uh, signed a pledge, uh, 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 nine companies, Moderna, BioNTech, AstraZeneca, uh, and, uh, and uh, Pfizer and uh, various other companies, signed a pledge uh, clearly defining, defining our goals and in a transparent fashion, making clear that we would, we would uh, only submit, submit uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, our documents for, for getting authorization if we have phase three data, if we have efficacy data, if we have the safety data. And that makes very clear that regardless of the societal pressure, regardless of the political pressure, yeah, we need to have a vaccine which is proven for efficacy, which is proven for safety. And that's the only way uh, to, to, uh, to create trust uh, and to enable that the vaccine vaccine is really taken taken by a broad community. Yeah, so I would agree with with what Uber said. I'd, I'd make two points. First, I think this commitment to data is also a commitment uh, to transparency and to sharing that data. I think you've seen uh, FDA on the U.S. side talk about getting an expert panel convened. So. Uh, the decision-making process here will be transparent, will be evidence-based, and will be the highest level of evidence uh, that they have. The last piece I would say is, um, you know, people ask me about political pressure. The biggest pressure we all have is the pressure we have within. This this is really personal. We all see what's happening out there. We, we all either have had uh, relatives affected or uh, have had colleagues uh, affected. And we all live in a very different world these days. I mean, you know, half of my team has never set foot in the building and I've yet to meet them and shake their hand personally. Uh, I, I have the luxury of working remotely, but that also means I can't go and visit mom who's 80 years old because she lives in a different country. And so this, the, the biggest pressure that my team and I, and I think everybody in this domain really wakes up every morning is that sense of uh, responsibility that we have a platform we believe can make a difference and it's up to us to demonstrate that the right way so that the public at large uh, understands this potential and comes to trust the uh, eventual utility of these vaccines to actually prevent disease and stop the pandemic.